What we're doing uh, is beginning a new series and a new uh, journey as we talk about this idea of who I am. We talk about this notion of, as the video talked about, we are going to take seriously who God says we are. Because I think we live in a world, we live in a culture, and we live in a time where we find our identity, we find out who we are, and we explore that through many different things in what I would believe are the wrong things. Because when you think about declaring the statement of who I am, I am a mom or a dad. I am an athlete. I'm a CEO. I'm a salesman. But then you have those people that say, well, I'm lonely or I'm struggling. People today, I'm questioning. I'm anxious. I'm guilty. Some believe I'm undesirable or unwanted. You think about all these different things. Each one of us comes in here today with an I am statement that is uniquely yours. You come in here, I am unworthy. Or maybe I am awesome. And you just have no issues going on right now, right? But either way, I am is specifically assigned to each of us. But just a couple of things to be thinking about. What we hear, meaning what people say to us, what, what we hear and watch on the news or the TVs, what we hear is not always truth about who we are. And that's the good things and the bad. Because people can puff you up and tell you you're great, but the reality is that only infl inflates your ego to a place of, is that really who I am? But then there are others that tear you down and speak ugly of you and speak down to you and belittle you. And is that really who you are? So what you hear does not always translate into truth. What we think and what is, is not always in line. For many of us, we have a different thought process about thinking about who we are. When we look in a mirror, what we think that we see is not really what we see. And oftentimes what we think of other people and what we think of them and how we think they are is not necessarily who they are. We're very, very good at thinking about who somebody is and sizing them up in about 30 seconds. But the reality is we're making judgments upon people and we're thinking of them in ways in our context and it's not through the, the right way of understanding who God sees them to be. And what we have and who we are does not always correlate. Just because God has given you a season and time of blessing, that doesn't mean that you're awesome and that you're living things right and doing things well. But just because you have little or God, you don't feel is answering questions or answering your prayers, or because you're struggling to make ends meet financially. That doesn't mean that God has ostracized you and put you away. That does not define who you are based upon what you have. And then you think about what you see. What you see and how we see ourselves is not always clear. And I believe it's because we are looking through a faulty lens. So when we think about this idea of who I am, I believe that in order to truly discover who we are, we need to understand whose we are before we can truly grasp and comprehend the idea of who I am. Because it's whose we are that makes us who we are. It's who God says we are is what truly defines us. It's not what we see. It's not what we think. It's not what we hear. And it's not what we have. It's what God says. It's in the authority of his word and who God is. And so we're going to go on a crazy journey. I'm just going to go ahead and own it. And I've been working on this and thinking about this in, in, in ways. And I know that in, in my flaws, I get it, that sometimes when we, we get a lot of content, I go really, really fast. And sometimes it can be like drinking water from a fire hydrant. I know that. I get it. So what I've resided to, to own and accept myself, we just made, this may be a two-part sermon. We're going to go slow because I, what I want to show and what God kept pressing upon my heart. There is a union between God the Father and God the Son that is uniquely special. Obviously, encompassing the Holy Spirit is the Trinity. And we're gonna build, and I wanna help build a case in that relationship and that connection between God the Father and God the Son. And how when we get into Ephesians chapter one, what, is, what we're going to see is the power of the relationship that exists between God the Father and the Son exists between us and the Father because of the Son. Does that make sense? Because I think that we can look and think about Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross and the work that he did. We can be atoned for our sin, but it stops there. We don't think about the blessings. We don't think about what God, how much God loves us as he loves his own son. 
And all of these things, being blessed in the beloved, as we'll get to and see in Scripture, that means something, I think, more than we have really put our mind around to understand. And so in order to get there, we need to build a foundation. So as it says with Ephesians chapter 1, we may get there, we may not today, but we are going to build a foundation on whose we are based on understanding a few wonderful People, to use a, a term that is probably completely heresy in speaking of God the Father and God the Son as we talk about who they are and who, what they mean to us. So to do that, I thought what a great way to do is to begin in John's gospel. In John's gospel, when John's beginning, he says this. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, Without him was not anything made that was made, and in him was life, and that life was the light of men. And then we know if we continue to read John's gospel that the word became flesh. We know the word logos is Jesus. And so when we think about whose we are, let's begin with articulating who Jesus is and is declared to be. In the beginning was the word. Jesus is eternal. Jesus was not created. Jesus has always been. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. And God, he was with God. And he was God. So the declaration of, of Jesus being with God, the second person of the Trinity, but incarnate, Jesus being God in the flesh. Jesus is Lord. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. So Jesus was a part of creation. Everything filtered through Jesus. Everything God spoke into creation and spoke it and created it all through Jesus that we see in, in, in there. And then was not anything made that was made. Again, so this idea and notion, it's not, we can't judge and understand God by looking at his created things. We have to look at God to be able to identify and understand who we are. But everything that we see is a part of his creation. And that's where we slip up. But you even read in Romans chapter one, we will, we will stop worshiping God and start being tempted to worship the created things because they're good and they're wonderful and they were created by God through Jesus Christ for a purpose, for our good and for our benefit. But they were not created to be worshiped. They were not created to find identity in or to find value and worth in. They were created for us to enjoy and for us to give a glimpse of what heaven could be like one day. And in him was life. And that life was the light of men. And so we think about in Jesus is life. There's two roads that we travel. We are either dead in our trespasses and sins and separated from God for all eternity, or we are alive together with Christ when we put our faith and trust in him. There is no gray road. There is, it is black and white when it comes to salvation and justification by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But when we see, when we put our faith in Christ, it's when we have life. Now, how we try creation into us, just a little nugget, where God says in the beginning, let us make man in our image. Let us, the plurality of God, the, the, the triune God that we worship, God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So what you bear, the image that you bear to the world is bearing an image and representation of God as we, where we live, work, and play. That's how we declare the gospel to people when we live out the gospel for others to see. Whether lost or saved alike, we are created in his image. And so we see, but those who follow Christ bear his image to the world and declare it. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So he gave us dominion over his creation. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So Jesus Christ is a part of creation. And Jesus Christ has declared that we were created in his image and so the image that we bear is of God. We were created to have dominion. But when we think about this idea of this image that we bear, what image is Christ bearing and how does that apply to us? When well, Hebrews chapter one, it says this, and speaking of Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God and he is the exact imprint of his nature. So when we see Jesus, we are seeing God the Father. That is a powerful statement of declaration. And, what, and he upholds the universe 
by the word of his power. So you remember how God spoke the world into creation. Jesus Christ upholds the universe by the word of his power. That is just awe-inspiring, is it not? And when you hear these passages of scripture and you think, you know, and I'll reinforce one to go with it, but how can people deny Jesus as Lord? If you do that, you have to deny the word of God. And therefore, if you deny the word of God, where's the basis of truth? Where is the foundation of what is truth? Therefore, there is a crumbling and there is no truth. If there is no truth to go back to, have a foundation for that we have. And therefore, who is right? Nobody knows. But we know that we can look to Scripture for the truth, for the vetting that it is in the declaration of God, the eyewitness testimony, and all the things that give us assurance of being able to our faith and trust in the Lord. But in Colossians chapter 1, uh, Paul writes this, he says, he is, speaking of Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. Again, a representation of God the Father in the flesh. The firstborn of all creation, not that Jesus was created, but showing in this verse his authority, that he is over all things, that that was how he was given to rule and to reign. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. There is nothing in creation that surprises God. There is nothing in creation that has not passed through the hand of God. There is nothing in creation that Jesus did not speak into existence. Jesus Christ is the creator of all things and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And we think about how powerful that is and what we see. And so we see the declaration of Jesus and the representation of being visible for us to see in, in, in God in the flesh is who we see Jesus to be. But I wanna go back and who God said he was. And in drawing into, we've seen what scripture says about Jesus. Let's see what God says about himself and let's see what Jesus says about himself. And so God said this to Moses in the burning bush uh, in the time of the Exodus. He said, God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, when that was translated years later through in the Septuagint, when it was all taken into Greek, that first part of that I am, this is getting a little nerdy, but it's ego aime. Ego aime was a declaration, which was a Greek word used there to begin the part of I am. And so he says, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you, which is ego aime. That's important for later. And God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, Yahweh. So now I am and Yahweh play off the same Hebrew word, Hayad. And that's totally wrong. And I, there's a guttural in there that I just, I can never get it in seminary, not getting it now. I got too much redneck in me. But it's Hayad, Hayad, something like to that effect. But they play off the same. So they're being used interchangeably here with I am and Yahweh. And that's significant. But he says, the, go, he says, say to the people of the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So I am has sent me to you. Yahweh has sent me to you. And this is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And that word Yahweh was so reverent that when the scribes would write of the Old Testament scriptures, when they would take out a new jar of ink and write Yahweh and they would throw it away because they would not contaminate and blend in the ink of other letters with the name of Yahweh for God, it meant something and it was serious. Fast forward to the New Testament and we're gonna be in John's gospel to understand in Jesus. But Jesus makes this declaration and speaking of all the things that he was prophesying about his death, and the resurrection, he says, I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Ego, I am he. So he was declaring and saying who he was in that moment. But even in the next verse that we'll see, hopefully it'll come up on the screen if it's not up there already. Yes, it is. I am telling, he says, then Jesus knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, who do you seek? 
And this is in the time when he was getting ready to be taken and beaten and, 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 and persecuted and, and, and killed. And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And what does he say? I am he. Ego I me. I am he. Where else did he say I am? If you read John's gospel, you know there are seven I am statements that come. I am the bread of life in John 6, 35. I'm the light of the world in John 8, 12. I am the door to the sheep in John 10, 7. I am the good shepherd in John 10, 11. I am, disappeared on my thing, the resurrection and the life in eleven twenty five, And you see here, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. And I am the true vine in John 15, 1. You see all these I am statements that he makes in that passage. But then the greatest one of all that he shares is in John 8, 58. And in John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Ego I may. And as if we wanted to know and be concerned about what did he really mean by that? Well, the very next passage that we learn and that we read, the Pharisees wanted to stone him and kill him for his declaration to be Lord. Jesus, there is no way that Jesus was anything other than a lunatic or Lord, according to C.S. Lewis. Jesus is God. And if we don't believe that, he says in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. And when he's speaking of that, what he's addressing is he's addressing a passage of scripture in Deuteronomy 6, 4, which is known to the Hebrews as the Shema. And the Shema was a prayer. And it was such an, a pivotal prayer in the life of the Jewish people that they would memorize it when they were children. And then it would be one of the last things that they would declare that they would say on their deathbed. This was something I, the Lord, our God, Elohim, the Lord is one. And that one there is plural in the one giving reference to the triune God that we worship and we serve. So Jesus is declaring, I and the Father are one. And so we look at that and we see how awesome it is to see there is absolutely no way that we can clearly articulate who Jesus is without talking about the Father. And just the same way, there is no way that we can talk about God Without, inter without using Jesus Christ to describe and to explain who God is. If we wanna know who God is, we look to Jesus. He's the imprint of God in the flesh. He is who we look to to understand who God is. He is who we look to to understand his compassion and his worth because he is Lord. And so clearly we're not, we're not gonna get very far, but what I wanna do is what I wanna share this morning is this idea of I wanna open this passage of scripture and I want us to read the first part of it in order to declare and understand so that we can see what we're going to build on in the next few weeks. But in, in Ephesians chapter one, and what I'll do uh, is, is I'll read the first, first three through six, and we'll be able to see this. And then I want to draw something out, and then we'll end our time together with that to, to build on the truth that we're going to build on. But in Ephesians chapter one, verse three, Paul writes this, he said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. If you like to write in your Bible, underline that. That we, who has blessed us in Christ. And what has he blessed us with? With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him. Underline that. When? Before the foundation of the world. You were chosen before the foundation of the world. Can you believe that? Nothing you have done has earned your salvation. Nothing you can do can bring you justification. Everything is rooted in the work of Jesus Christ. And that was the purpose of God from the very beginning. And so he says, and then we were chosen before the foundation of the world. What should we do with that? That we should be holy and blameless before him. 
that we should live before him a life that brings him glory and honor, not to please him, not to, not to earn his favor, because as we will see, we are blessed in Christ. Our identity is sealed. Our identity is solidified. It is permanent. It is complete. It is fulfilled. That when we live for him, we live in a way to honor the completeness that he has, comp that he has given to us. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. And so what I want to look in this is, is just a couple things in a passage of scripture. And then we're going to come back in two weeks to, to really drive this home as we talk about it. But when we think about who I am, number one, I am a child of God. Yes, my, Danny and Marty Hearn are my mother and my father, and I love them dearly but I'm not defined by my mom and my dad on earth. I'm defined as a child of God in heaven. But even more impressive than that is the fact that I am also an heir with Christ. And what is a passage of scripture that I believe that really drives this home is Romans 8. The spirit himself so here's the third person of the Trinity entering, to, entering into our identity as Christians. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, the spirit within us, that we are children of God. And if we are children of God, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with who? With Christ. And if we are heirs with Christ, we are provided, provided we suffer, supper, you like that, is that up there? How's that? How'd I do? I was all over the place when I was doing this. Thought I caught it all, but spell check can't spell check a correct spelling of the wrong word. So we pr provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The reason why that's so powerful is because guys, when, sh when trouble happens in your life, when things are hard in your life, your natural inclination is to think God is not pleased with me. And there is nowhere in scripture where that is, comes to pass as truth. That things will happen, suffering will come. But what we need to understand is that is a part of being a part of being an heir with Christ and pursuing Christ's likeness. Our identity is not conditionally based upon anything. It is unconditionally declared by the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what we are going to do over the next few weeks, we are going to really unpack this idea of whose I am. We are a child of God and we are an heir with Christ. And that union that takes place between God the Father and God the Son is the union and position that we have with God the Father. Because Jesus is even declared to be in Hebrews that we, he calls us brothers as he is in the flesh, as our connection to God the Father through what he did on earth in the flesh for us, for you and me to bring us back into right relationship with him. So I, I plead with you to think, over the next just hours and weeks and months, how do you define yourself? I hope that you begin with, I am a child of God. I am an heir with Christ. I am a redeemed new creation. The old has passed away. I take seriously the forgiveness of my sins. I take seriously the command to live for him in response to what he did for me so I can declare the glory of his grace to other people to see. That there will be times, as the video said earlier, that we are going to mess up, but what a great opportunity for God's grace just to grow deeper and wider for other people to see. But again, it does not define who we are. The definition of who we are is summed up in who God declares us to be, which is heirs with Jesus Christ. And he said about Jesus, in whom I am well pleased. 
Do not leave here today doubting the pleasure that God has for you and in you because he is pleased with you. He is not pleased with sin, but sin is no longer a part of you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it has been washed away and all your unrighteousness has been removed. The only reason why we continue to sin is slipping into the old patterns and allowing the enemy to seep in and to deceive us and to lead us and to guide us astray. But we have power over sin and darkness. We can declare that away and we can live for him and bring him glory and honor when we truly embrace our identity. We can't continue to look and and think about the things that we hear. We can't continue to build our identity based upon the things that we think. We can't find our identity based upon the things that we have or don't have. And we certainly can't base it upon the things that we see. It has to be rooted and based in what we see and what we know from what the word of God declares to be and what the word of God declares who you are and who I am, who you are, who we are as a church. We are children of God. We are heirs with Christ. And as we are heirs with Christ, we have a responsibility to spread his fame, to spread his glory for all to hear and for all to see. And so in two weeks, we're going to see and understand whose we are even more as we break down Ephesians 3, 1 through 10. And then we're going to go on this journey to understand who we are in Christ. And then we're going to unpack and understand who we are for Christ. And then lastly, what we will do is who we are to the world. And when we understand that and we understand our role and our purpose and our identity, what I believe that is going to do is spark something in us to be the ambassadors for Christ, a Christ we are called to be. We are going to be more confident in who we are. And I believe when confidence breeds action, when you're confident in yourself and you're confident in who you are, you do more, you are more, you live out more, and you're more bold and you're more courageous. And that confidence must be built. We don't, you are not motivated by, sh- by shame and guilt. You are motivated by the conviction and understanding of your identity and whose you are. And I pray that over the next few weeks, we'll be able to identify and understand that together as we go on this journey. But what I wanna do is I wanna close with prayer. And we're going to sing one last song that I think really encapsulates this idea of being a child of God. So let's just, during this time of invitation, let's worship together. But also as any time of invitation, it's not an opportunity just for us to stand up and sing. It's not an opportunity for us just to, just to be closing out of the service, but it is an opportunity for you to respond. If the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart and maybe you're wrestling with your identity, maybe you're wrestling with understanding who you are, maybe there's sin and guilt and conviction going on in you that you need to go away so that you can pursue Christ with greater fullness and greater strength and greater confidence. There are people that wanna pray with you. There are people that would love to just be able to pray over you, to send you out of here in a way that can be encouraging and uplifting. And I pray that we can use this time to, to end our worship together in that way and in that manner. So if you would, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for the blessing that it is to be children, that we are owned and adopted by you. And that came at an incredible cost. May we not lose sight of the fact that that our heritage and our inheritance was paid through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. That God, when we see the compassion, the love, the sacrifice of Jesus, that God, we see you. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for taking upon our sin on the cross, dying in our place so that we could be saved. We thank you for the power of the resurrection of raising Jesus from the dead to give us the hope of eternal life that we have, that our hope is not based upon the things that we see in this world, but on the promises of God for all eternity. May we stop living for today and start living for eternity because eternity has no regrets because what you've promised is beautiful and it is awesome and it is powerful. But God, we can't embrace those truths without the power of your spirit coming into our heart, convicting us of our sin and drawing us to you for salvation. If there's anybody in here today, Father, that... Lord, they may be struggling with who they are because they don't know whose they are because they never knew how much you loved them. May they hear that message today, Father, that you love them and you love them so much you sent your son to die on the cross for their sins. 
And all you ask in return is by faith that we turn to you to believe in the Son, to believe in His work, to believe that He is Lord, to believe that you raised Him from the dead, to believe that we can have life in His name. And I pray for those here today that are going to believe that for the very first time. But I pray for those of us here today that when we think about who we are, I am lonely, I am hurting, I'm struggling, I'm anxious. I'm weary, I'm unloved, I'm unworthy. God, we are not because we are loved by you. And there is no greater love to embrace and there is no greater love to have and to enjoy than your love. Father, may we quit seeking love from this world, the counterfeit, and may we seek your love the sins that entangle us, the things that are blocking us, the relationships that are untethered. Just, Lord, Father, would you just please reunite us to you, purify us in the belief and understanding of who we are. We are already forgiven and set free. It's in the past tense declared in your word. May we live in that identity and embrace it. But God, may we not allow the enemy to be crafty and to stumble us and make us fall. May we look to you. May we live for you. May we love you. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for Jesus. And we thank you that we can be called children of God.